At a home unit in Wollongong, south of Sydney, a man is preparing to dispose of a teenage girl's body. The body has been decapitated and the fingers removed. He wraps the girl's head in his dressing gown and puts it and the fingers into a plastic garbage bag. In another bag, he methodically collects a small evening purse, some clothes and jewellery. He then rolls the naked, headless body in two of his bed sheets, carries it to his car and heaves it into the boot. He then drives off to dump the body in the bags in local bushland. When the body is discovered the next day, police appear to have very few clues with which to solve a baffling crime. Do you mind this for me? I'll be back soon, all right? Yeah, sure, mate. After a brilliant, groundbreaking forensic investigation, a man was eventually caught and jailed. But incredibly, 30 years later, he was to become Australia's most wanted criminal. In 1981, 19-year-old Kim Barry was a normal Australian teenager who loved to dance and dreamed of being a nurse. With her parents, Brian and Beverly, and younger brother Wayne, Kim lived at Mount Pleasant in Wollongong, south of Sydney. Kim was a lovely girl. Um, for those who knew her, as, as I did, she was a very trustworthy person to the point where I allowed her to babysit my two children on occasions. To me, she was always happy and bright, very outgoing, but then very outgoing on the outside, but very sensitive on the inside. It's just a general run-of-the-mill teenager. To help keep her nursing dream alive, she regularly volunteered to help nurse disabled children at Cram House, a local hostel. Kim was one of the girls that really had a heart for those kids and she really was interested in uh, taking care of them, helping with, with them, you know, to uh, feed them and clean them because they, they needed cleaning permanently, of course, they were, they were that handicapped. And, um, I, I loved working with her because she was a really good worker. I really thought she was very nice. On Friday, the 6th of February, 1981, Kim Barry's parents, Brian and Beverly, were out of town for the night. Taking the chance for some freedom, Kim wagged her duties watching over her 15-year-old brother, Wayne, and instead went to the movies with her friend, Donna Holland. Afterwards, the girls visited a popular local disco, the Crown Gardens. Also in the disco this night was 23-year-old miner, Graham Potter, who was celebrating his Bucks night. Hey, hey, slow down there. He and fiancée, Cherie Jones, were due to be married in eight days' time on Valentine's Day. It was a joint celebration, as it was also a 21st birthday party for Graham's younger brother, Glenn. The disco craze is still raging in 1981, and the Potter boys were keen dancers, having studied at a local modern dance studio. Kim also studied dancing at the same school and even had a brief crush on Graham. I think I'm just going to go home soon. I feel really sick. Come on, stay. I don't want to be left here by myself. Look, you can stay at my house. My parents are away. I'm scared of prowlers. Donna decided to head home. She wasn't feeling well and had to get up early for work. Come on, please, I'd do it for you. Kim begged her friend to stay, saying she could sleep over at the Barry house. She says her parents were away and she was afraid of prowlers. But Donna saw this as a silly excuse 
simply to get her to stay. She checked Kim's purse to make sure she had enough money for a taxi, then said goodnight. Bye. I'll call you in the morning anyway. OK. This was the last time she saw her friend. Thanks, mate. Graham, how are you going? Kim! <laughs> it wasn't long before Kim spotted Graham Potter at the bar and walked over to say hello. Hey, let's go around the corner and have a seat. Yeah, sure. Have a chat. So you're having a good night? Yeah, I'm having a great night. That's good. Uh, I really like your hair, by the way. It looks really nice. They went back to the lounge together to talk. Some time later, Graham walked over to Glenn's table and handed him the bottle of wine and his cardigan, saying he'd be back soon. We'll be back soon, all right? Yeah, sure, mate. How about this place? It's actually yeah, it was really good. Graham and Kim then took a taxi to Graham's unit in nearby Coromel. Yeah, it was great. Really pumping, really full of energy. Look at this. Music. All right. <laughs> About an hour later, Graham arrived back at the disco alone. That's you go. No, mate. Got it to the inner door. She got cold feet and left. So I left too. No way. I need a drink, man. It was free. Yeah, no, I'll take that. Take that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Mate, you've got nothing to worry about. You've already you've got a wife. Oh, you. come on, man. The next day, Saturday, Kim Barry's parents arrived home to find she had left her 15-year-old brother, Wayne, at home alone and had been out all night. On Sunday afternoon, apprentice plumber Scott Davies arrived at the nearby Jamboree Mountain Lookout. He needed to repair his old Holden and wondered if there might be any spare parts to be found among the wrecks dumped in the bush below. There was no safety fence at the lookout, so to get a closer look at the wrecks below, Scott crawled carefully down a track just below the edge and looked over the sheer drop. Amid the rusty wrecks in the undergrowth, he suddenly spotted what appeared to be a naked body wedged against a tree. The head was out of sight. Shit. Horrified, he scrambled back to the top to get help. The body is in a crouching position with rope tying the heels to the wrists. A bra and bone-coloured blouse have been used to bind the arms together. The head is not obscured by the tree, as first thought, it's been cut off entirely at the base of the neck. And the fingers look like they've been chopped off at the knuckles. It was a very barbaric murder. Uh, fingers severed, um, head decapitated, and no sign of either anywhere near the body. They've just been flung over a cliff at uh, Tied, tied with rope and just thrown over the cliff. Had it have not lodged where it did, next to the tree, then it would certainly have travelled a lot further and uh, probably never ever been found. Uh, but, or if it had been found, it would have been found in a skeletal, skeletal state. It was recovered and taken back to the morgue and... Uh, I, <laughs> having worked at Homicide for many years and seen some, some pretty gruesome stuff, that's probably the most grisly I've ever had to, had to deal with. On Sunday evening, Graham Potter and his fiancée, Cherie Jones, are at her house watching the TV news when the discovery of the body is reported. Graham leaves abruptly and spends much of that night giving his home unit at Coromel a thorough cleaning. At the Jamboree Mountain lookout, police began a massive search of the area. Organised a bit of a search around the area looking for the head and the hands, which was fruit, fruitless. When we examined the body, we found that it had an unusual bra attached to it and a blouse. Um, that was the only clues that we had as to who this girl might be. An autopsy found there was no evidence of sexual assault. 
She had a broken right arm at post-mortem and a post-mortem that did not show cause of death. Here was the ultimate challenge to police. First of all, to identify the body. There was a possibility that the girl's palm prints might be on file somewhere. There were no computers about. It was handed to me to search those handprints against all uh, known females wherever possible, uh, drugs, offences particularly, if I could, and uh, endeavour to identify them. Without a computer, it was a Herculean task. I did not relish the job at all, but I remember digging out a few hundred palm prints and going through them. Faced with so little to go on, detectives held a news conference on Monday morning and made the unusual decision to display their only clues. And um, although it was going to be quite gruesome uh, for the public to see, the only way we could see that you could um, have this uh, person identified, this female identified, was to show the clothing uh, that was found. And that was a brassiere and a, um, and a blouse. And um, we actually had to get uh, permission from the superintendent in charge of the CIB to, to, to do that. And um, it was broadcast on, on um, national television. On Monday night, Kim Barry's mother, Beverly, arrived home from work just in time to see the bra and blouse displayed on the TV news. It turned out that uh, Bevy noticed a motif on the top of the bra which was exactly the same as Kim's. And this upset her very much, because she knew it was Kim's in her own mind. When we come home, she was very upset. And I said, sweetheart, don't be silly, it's not Kim. But anyway, we'll go into the police and check it all out and make sure so she understands the situation. Terry Dawson, who was my workmate, was with the Barrys in the viewing room. And he was thinking how terrible it was for this poor Brian Barry to have to stare at this headless, fingerless body. And then we went and identified her by the birthmark, a heart-shaped birthmark she had just below her breast. So yes, it was Kim. And Bevy was very upset, as I was at the time. And poor old Pop sitting on the front steps, you know, and I'm saying, I remember grabbing him and saying, Pop, is it Kim, is it Kim? And he couldn't answer me. And then I went inside and, without knocking of course, and Bev and Brian, I just hugged them, we couldn't talk. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, I didn't have to ask them, was it Kim? On Monday morning, Graham Potter withdraws nearly $3,000 in small bills from his bank and then makes out a will leaving everything to Cherie. He also gives his solicitor a letter for her, telling the lawyer that he's in trouble and must go away. Then he rings Glenn to say he's leaving town. The next day, Cherie received the letter from Potter, telling her simply that he'd gone away, declaring his undying love and promising her that in time, he'd explain his reasons. A few weeks passed and public interest was beginning to wane when suddenly another shocking discovery thrust the case back into the headlines. The body of Wollongong teenager Kim Barry, with her head and fingers Shit. removed, was found in bushland in 1981. There was media speculation that the gruesome killing and mutilation was the work of hardened criminals, possibly drug dealers. The police immediately assumed it was drug related. Mainly the postmortem showed no evidence of sexual assault and 
they likened it to a recent case called the Mr. Asia inquiry, where the uh, drug lords disposed of their uh, unwanted couriers by removing their heads and fingers, or hands even. No, I had to stop. We've got too busy. Who were we were looking for? We were looking for um, some person with, it was suggested at different times that it was a, a person with surgical background. It was a satanic ritual. Uh, or, or similar things when the body was found. But these people, the public in Wollongong, were, were frightened. And we had to work very, very hard to allay their fears and to bring a person into custody. Police investigated every aspect of Kim's life and they were soon convinced she was a clean living, kind, caring and responsible young woman. We knew there was no drugs because there was things that come up through school and that sort of situation and the way she didn't be want to become involved with girls involved in that scene uh, throughout her school life and particularly in the high school. There was no, no suggestion whatsoever that uh, Kim was involved in any way in anything other than a, uh, a lawful occupation and a, uh, a good family girl. We then had a copy of the clothing that she wore on that night made up exactly the same and on the Friday night following her death we uh, displayed this together with a photo of uh, Kim outside the disco and uh, as a result a number of people came forward and told us that they'd seen her at the disco that night. Hi, can I please have a bottle of Lee for our wine? One of the bar attendants remembered serving Kim a bottle of Libra wine. It was the only bottle of that wine brand sold that night. Meanwhile, Graham's sudden disappearance caused one friend who'd partied with the Potters at the disco to wonder if there was a connection with Kim's murder. He reported his suspicions to police. Information was received to the inquiry that, that Potter had gone missing from the area. And... Um, that was just put on a, what we call a running shoot at that time. And um, my workmate and I, Gary Roberts, were given the, uh, the job of trying to track down where this Graham Potter might be. Oh, thanks, mate. Thank Checks on Potter's background showed that as well as working in the mines, he had also worked as an assistant at a hospital morgue where he would have observed post-mortem examinations. I know, I know, I haven't seen you. The major breakthrough came when they established that not only was Potter at the disco, but there was absolute proof he was actually with Kim. Do you really want to stay around here? I was thinking of leaving. Change the scene? Yeah. What about Mike? When my workmate and I went and interviewed one of the witnesses, she indicated to us that she was sitting there and a person she knew, being Graham Potter, walked over and put a bottle of Lifra wine on the table as if to say, well, you finish this. We knew from previous information that Kim Barry had purchased the only bottle of leaf from wine that night. So that put Potter with Kim Barry. And then the information that he'd left the area and start us on, started us on his trail. Police immediately interview Potter's family and obtain a warrant to search his Coromel unit. They're surprised to find it's been thoroughly cleaned and is completely empty. It was strange because um, Cherie Jones and the, and the Potter family decided to put the, the unit on the market after Potter disappeared. And all of the things that were, that were in the unit when this crime took place, had been removed and taken to the parents' house. Police issued a bulletin to watch out for Cherie's 1970 white Holden sedan. Newspapers published photos of Potter, but all police would say is that he was a person of interest and may have information that could help the investigation. on a warm Saturday morning. Three weeks since Kim Barry's brutal murder, 
a local man was out driving on the Jamboree Mountain Road. He let the dog out of his car and the dog called him back but the dog wouldn't come. He then uh, made a search to find the dog and found the skull, a human skull. Uh, he, of course, contacted the police and uh, we attended there. And the next day, the skull was examined and the teeth were examined and found that they were identical to Kim Barry's teeth and, of course, it was her skull. Once again, police rescue squad officers converged on the area and mounted a widespread search. Not long after it commenced, um, one of the boys came up to me, one of the uh, senior constables, and he said he'd found a trail of hair. And basically this trail of hair led from where the skull was right back to an area hidden or in Lantana, in Lantana where there was a plastic bag. And uh, it was examined by our forensic people and it was found that there was a, a dressing gown and some sheets, blood stained in the bag together with the tips of Miss Barry's fingers. About the same time that the skull, fingers and other evidence were found in the bush, Potter's car was found at Goulburn, 130 kilometres to the west. He, he took his fiancée's car, which we believe was involved in the disposal of the body, um, to uh, outside um, Goulburn Police Station, and then he decamped from there, leaving the car and a bloodstained shirt uh, in the car, which was his shirt, and which was later matched to, the, the blood was later matched to that of Kim Barry. No other blood was found, either inside the car or in the boot. Sitting on the dash was another love note from Potter to Cherie, telling her that he had left because he believed his life may have been in danger. And again, he promised to phone and explain everything. A police search team revisited his unit, this time with forensic biologist Joy Cool, who conducted tests for blood in all rooms of the apparently spotless unit. In the bathroom upstairs, Joy Cool found evidence of blood in the basin drain and on a tap. In the spare bedroom, two more blood stains were found, and then she spots shampoo bubbles near the edge of one wall but she lifted the carpet in the second bedroom and on the underneath part of the carpet, there was a significant blood stain. Some hairs were also found in some fresh paint along the skirting boards. They also found Kim's hair in the clothes dryer. All the blood samples gave a positive match to Kim's rare blood type. Her blood group fell in a very rare category. Less than 1% of the population had such a blood group, and this is years before DNA. So we had a person, uh, less than one in 100 had such a blood group. Meanwhile, another search team descended on the Potter family home to examine Graham's stored possessions. They found some bottles of cleaner, a few paint pots and a hacksaw. Inside a wardrobe moved from Graham's unit, they found traces of blood. And I found um, similar um, sheeting, uh, flannelette sheeting, um, and I also found a uh, dressing gown cord which matched the, uh, the blue coloured dressing gown that was found. Later that day, I took Mrs Potter to the scientific section at Wollongong, and she identified the items as belonging to her son. The government medical officer, Dr. Vincent Verzosa, found the fingertips corresponded exactly to the hands on Kim's body. The skull has a large area of missing bone on the left temple. The indent in the bone and the way it has been crushed inwards indicates it was made by a large, heavy object. Dr. Verzosa takes a spanner found among Graham's possessions and compares it to the indent in the skull. Uh, it was subjected to a number of tests, uh, but um, it was negative for blood. But it, it, suited, the, it suited the wounds uh, that were on the skull when it was found. 
even though there's no proof it's the murder weapon, the other circumstantial evidence against Potter is now overwhelming. When the fugitive finally reappears, he surprises everyone by vehemently protesting his innocence. And he has a dramatic explanation for how Kim Barry was killed. A brilliant forensic investigation into the murder and mutilation of teenager Kim Barry has identified the likely killer. Blood traces matching Kim's rare blood type are found in the home unit and on the clothes of 23-year-old minor Graham Potter. A national manhunt is underway. Uh, all other people were eliminated as suspects at that stage through our investigations. And uh, it was a matter of finding Graham Jean Potter and being able to question him. Various sightings of Potter were reported from around Australia, but none could be verified. Um, we always felt that he would return home because he was close to his family. But um, it, was, so it was a waiting game. In early April, a motorist driving to Wollongong tells collectors at the old toll booths on the F6 expressway that he's seen Potter trying to hitch a lift. A few nights later, Potter sneaks into his parents' home and after a tear-filled reunion, he tells them his version of what happened to Kim Barry. What you're about to see is a reenactment of that amazing story. On the evening of Glen's 21st, Graham left his car at his Coromel home unit and the two brothers took a cab into town. Oh, hey, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, mate. Graham, how are you going? Kim! <laughs> how are you? Around midnight at the Crown Gardens disco, Potter says he met a girl he knew as Kim and they talked on the lounge. You look upset. What's the matter? These two men were harassing me. They kept walking up and threatening me. Why would they want to do something like that? I don't know, but I want to leave. She told him she was trying to hide from two men who might even be waiting for her outside. Sure, I'll... Potter says he agreed to escort her to a taxi. Hey, bro, do you mind this for me? He left her half-finished bottle of wine and his cardigan with Glenn and his friends and went outside with her to the taxi rank. I don't know who But once outside the disco, Kim told him she was afraid to go home alone. Mum and Dad aren't home. I don't want, I'm too scared to go home. Please, I'll tell you everything. Please. All right. I'm not far. I'm just... OK, thank you. You'll be all right. Potter agreed to take her back to his unit where she'd be safe. He says it was about 1am when they arrived at his unit. This is my place. Have a seat. Make a cup of coffee and you can tell me everything about it, all right? Thank you. All right. There was a knock at the door. Who's that? And Graham assumed it was a friend who'd missed the Bucks party. Hey. But hey. when he opened oh, the door, hey. two strange hey. men no, pushed no. their way in. Do you know these people? It's all right. Just let me talk to them. They wanted to talk privately to Kim and told Potter that unless he wanted to get hurt, he sure? was to go upstairs. It's OK. He says Kim assured him that she'd be all right, so he went upstairs and waited. Did you think he'd get away with it? Suddenly, he heard shouting and loud noises. Go! Ah! He says he went down and found Kim lying on the floor with one man kneeling over her. The other man was searching through her purse. He saw blood and realised Kim had been killed. One of the men grabbed him, twisted his arm back 
pushed his face up against the wall and told him that if he didn't keep his mouth shut, he'd also be killed along with his family. He says he begged them not to hurt him and promised he wouldn't say anything. Potter then claims they ordered him to return to the disco and act normally. They warned him that if he told anyone, then he'd be blamed for the murder as it happened in his unit. He hurriedly left and caught a cab. It was a bit after two when he got back to the disco. How'd you go? Oh, he says he followed the murderer's instructions, continuing to party with Glenn and their friends as if nothing had happened. Come on, mate, we gotta get you home. At 4 a.m., he and his brother took a taxi back to the unit. Graham Potter says nothing about the murder. All right, come on, mate. Next step, next step. Come on. Oh, jeez. On entering the living room, he says he was relieved to see a blanket had been thrown over the area of the floor where he last saw Kim's body. Doing well. I go on the couch, all right? Glenn went to sleep on the couch. Graham claims he headed upstairs to bed and cried himself to sleep. Potter's story then became even more bizarre. He says Glenn left at 7 a.m. And soon afterwards... Morning, sunshine. Let's go. Don't no, move. The murderers returned and forced Graham upstairs, where they revealed Kim's body in the spare bedroom. He says he was forced to stand by while the men decapitated the body using a knife and meat saw taken from the kitchen. They then instructed him to dispose of the body, warning him that if he didn't continue to cooperate, he would be blamed for the murder. Potter says he was now in too deep to turn back. Look at us. When the murderers left, he hitchhiked into Wollongong, where he borrowed Cherie's car and, at about 8.30am, returned to the unit. He tied Kim's hands and feet using her bra and blouse and then wrapped the body in his sheets and carried it to the car. Kim's purse, rings and the rest of her clothes were then placed in a third bag, along with a blood-stained rolling pin that he says he assumed was the murder weapon. He then drove up to Jamboree Mountain Lookout where he dumped the body. Returning back down the mountain road, frightened and confused, he says he suddenly remembered the bag with Kim's belongings in the boot and threw it into the bush. Further on, he realised the bag with the body parts was still behind his seat, so he pulled over again to throw it away. After staying with Cherie on Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday, Potter spent Sunday night cleaning his unit to remove all traces of the murder. On Tuesday, he drove to Goulburn, abandoned Cherie's car and took a train to Melbourne where he changed his appearance. He dyed his hair 
He'd uh, dyed his um, chest hair uh, to a reddish colour, so he'd obviously wanted to disguise himself while he was on the run, because uh, his photo was national wide um, as being wanted for Kim Barry's murder. Potter says he flew to New Zealand, where he found a job. He says it was not until he heard he was under investigation that he decided to return to Wollongong and assist police with their inquiries. When Potter arrives home, his family called the police and he was promptly charged with the murder. He refused to answer any police questions, to make any statement or to give any blood or hair samples. In fact, it's not until his trial that the police and public first heard his bizarre explanation of what happened. Wollongong miner Graham Jean Potter was charged with the murder of teenager Kim Barry in 1981. At that stage, he would only tell his lawyers the whole story and even added some new information. Part of that statement also said, I remember on the way home, uh, I, I said to Kim, will you pay for the taxi? And she showed me a purse that had no money in it. But I did notice all these little white packets, plastic bags full of white powder. But I didn't think anything of it at the time. Another logic tells you that if you've got a $100,000 worth of heroin in your bag, which was disproved later, <laughs> that you wouldn't be showing it to some idiot and saying you haven't got a penny. On July 22nd, 1981, Potter appeared at a magistrate's committal hearing. Among the spectators were Kim's parents, Brian and Beverly. The hearing lasted several days and Brian attended every day, but refused to allow his wife to be there when evidence of Kim's mutilation was presented. The prosecution called more than 50 witnesses to outline all the evidence pointing to Potter as the killer. It wasn't until the defence applied again for Potter to be released on bail that his incredible story of Kim being murdered by two men was publicly aired for the first time. The revelation caused uproar in the courtroom. He returned to the, the disco. He went past, it went a short distance from Wollongong Police Station. So if he, his story has later, later come out that two other people had killed a Kim Barry, and had left and told him to get rid of the body. He, he was by himself. Why would he have gone to the police station? If you had got attacked by drug men and told to get away down to the dance hall and you came back three hours later, wouldn't you search the house with these terrifying thugs? But he doesn't even look into the spare bedroom. He, he alleged these two men had killed the girl. Let's go. And they got to come back to the uh, to the scene of the crime after they let a person go and let him do whatever he liked to do. Police could have been wait, could be there examining the body. You've got to get rid of the body. You're going to do that? All right, do it. All right. And of course, he went to the extraordinary length of dumping the body in one location, and then of course the head and fingers in another location. While Potter's on the run, all the stories he's been reading, up until he ran and afterwards, always seem to carry the same theme. People who chop heads off, people who remove hands, are in the drug tray. Oh, no! Potter's lawyers again sought to have him released on bail. The request was again denied, but the court ordered that his story of the two men be investigated. A police identikit expert was sent to Sydney's Long Bay Jail, where Potter spent an amazing four and a half hours over two days choosing the facial features to make up portraits of the men. The identikit expert says witnesses usually chose the eyes first, but Potter kept changing the eyes. 
and uh, we had to then go around and see all the witnesses we knew from the disco and find out whether anyone had seen those particular men. Nobody had seen those men. The trial opened in the Wollongong Supreme Court in March 1982. Joy Cool presented her evidence of the blood stains found in Potter's unit matching Kim's rare blood type. Even more sensational were the tests on a hacksaw found among Potter's possessions. A number of scientific tests were done by uh, Detective Sergeant Henry Delaforce, an incredible scientific fellow and probably one of the best in New South Wales at that time, if not the best. Sergeant Delaforce had to uh, give illustrations of the markings left on bones using different uh, saw blades. Delaforce also showed that pliers had most likely been used to remove the fingers from Kim's left hand. After 11 days of evidence, the Crown rests its case. Graham Potter is the only witness for the defence, but even so, he avoids any questions. Instead, he makes what is called a doc statement, thereby avoiding being cross-examined. He would have given himself in such a tangle that it would have been obvious to anyone that he was guilty. His, his legal advice would have given him, don't possibly get in the witness box because you're going to be ripped apart. In his summing up, Graham's barrister pointed out that police had shown no motive for the killing. He also suggested that the two methods of removing the fingers was proof that two murderers were involved. The defence position was that Graham cooperated with the killers and ran away because he was genuinely in fear for his life. Crown prosecutor, Mr Joseph Gibson QC, then summed up calling Graham Potter a cold, cunning and calculating killer. Just over an hour later, the jury declared Graham Potter guilty of the murder. I remember Justice O'Brien making comment about that, what tremendous um, scientific work had been done, more particularly by Sergeant Delaforce and all members of the, of the investigative team. It was, it was a, a really uh, a jigsaw puzzle that came together because of scientific work. It was a forensic evidence that, uh, that carried through on the day because there was never any admissions. Witnesses, there wasn't any to my knowledge. Um, and it was a very difficult case that had to be proved on uh, forensic evidence. Are you satisfied that justice has been done? Yes, the judicial system has worked in accordance with the evidence described. A few months later, he married Cherie in a brief ceremony inside Goulburn Jail. He continued to protest his innocence, and his new wife and the rest of the Potter family vowed to continue the fight for his freedom. When all appeals failed, they tried to get the case reheard by the High Court of Australia, but the request was rejected. In April 1982, Wollongong miner Graham Potter is convicted of the murder of 19-year-old Kim Barry. A lasting question hanging over the case is why? The motive suggested by police and prosecutors is that Potter took Kim home intending to have sex with her. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. One coming up. His, his idea of romance in this situation is he's probably had several drinks since his bucks night. He's going to play games until dawn with this lass. Thank you. Cheers. It's all about you and me tonight. What have you got there? But somewhere... Are you getting married next week? Kim Barry decides that it's getting out of hand. Yeah, but I'm not married now. Or Kim Barry has noticed a photograph, perhaps, of 
the killer with his girlfriend, his fiancée. There could have been many indications that we are not aware of. But logic tells me she has found out about this romance and I want to go back to the disco. No. No. You've come all this way. You don't have to be getting disappointed. Stop worrying about it. Stop worrying about it. Hey, stop. Stop worrying about it. All right? Stop it. Let go! Let go! Hey! Detectives have even suggested that Kim may have not been killed with the first blow. I believe she was unconscious. Um, that is supported by the fact that um, Kim and her girlfriend had purchased some food between when they'd been at the cinema and when they attended the disco. When Kim Barry's, when the, the body of Kim Barry was subject to post-mortem, um, there were no stomach contents which indicated that there was a complete digestion of the food over a period of time. The post-mortem indicates she may have been left dying in Potter's unit for some hours. Detectives believe Potter must have lost his temper and hit Kim hard enough to cause her serious injury. She may have even lost consciousness at that point. It looks like the killer has struck the girl savagely with a right-handed blow and then losing all libido or other intents he had in mind, has uh, decamped from the scene and immediately got a taxi back to the disco, which is a 15-minute drive, to establish an alibi when she might die because he thought, or I believe he thought she was going to die. Jeez. Sorry. Come on, man. Come on. When the party wound down at the disco, the Potter brothers headed back to Graham's unit. All right, have a good sleep. Brother's gone to sleep downstairs, and the killer has gone to uh, gone upstairs to allegedly go to bed. He goes in and checks the spare room, but to his amazement, Kim Barry is still alive. It's believed Potter then panicked took a heavy object, similar to a spanner or a rolling pin. And brought it down on the girl's head. This was proven at post-mortem, two uh, heavy strikes to the head by a right-handed person. But even then, she still is breathing. The blow to the front of the head doesn't always kill that easy. So then I believe, in my own mind, that he's strangled her. And this was supported later by the pink discoloration of the teeth. There was some forensic evidence that when a person is strangled, the tiny capillaries in the teeth themselves will burst and the blood the moisture of the blood will dry out and leave a pink discoloration at the bottom part of the teeth. In 1987, bushwalker Rod Pettit discovered a garbage bag in dense bush near Jamboree Mountain Road. Inside was Kim's purse, her jewellery and clothes. I opened the bag up and I found the card with Kim Barry's name on it and it had a couple of dollars in the old green two dollar notes in there and that was it. Then I found the, the rolling pin and, and, and I'm sure there was a pair of shoes and a belt and I think a dress. There was no blood on the rolling pin either but there's scarcely any doubt as to what part it played in the murder of this young girl. The contents of the purse matched Donna's description exactly right down to the two $2 notes she had saved for her cab fare home from the disco. This is a little class purse which Kim had. Uh, and as you can see, to get uh, tons of drugs in that, I don't know what he referred to as tons, but I doubt very much whether you get too much in there. In 1996, after 15 years in custody, Potter was released on parole. 
Kim's family had to learn to live with the grief of losing their beloved daughter. Throughout the ordeal, Brian attempted to shield his wife from the worst aspects of the case and the gruesome details at the trial. It was not until years later and after Beverly had died that Brian discovered that she had eventually found her own way to cope through forgiveness. My wife it forgave him long before I ever did. I didn't know that till after she died. Uh, my son forgave him long before I ever did. I'm the only one that didn't. I didn't give him for 23 years uh, because he hadn't. He still doesn't admit that as far as I know that he was guilty. Uh, that aside, uh, it's not between me and him anymore. It's between him and God. And uh, the only way I can get on with my life was for, to forgive him. And Graham Jean Potter, I have forgiven you. God be with you. Make your peace with God. After his release from prison, Graham Jean Potter moved to Tasmania, where police say he joined criminal gangs, which led to him today being named as Australia's most wanted man. So whilst in jail, though, he had sort of formed some associates um, or associations with sort of numerous um, or other criminal people, um, one of them in particular being Pat Barbaro, who is um, rumoured to be uh, head of the Australian Mafia. In 2008, in Tasmania, Potter was one of 24 people charged when Australian Federal Police Operation Inca uncovered the world's largest ever ecstasy importation. They seized 15 million ecstasy tablets imported from Italy and worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Among those nabbed was Pasquale Barbaro, a chieftain in the feared Calabrian Mafia, based around Griffith in southern New South Wales. Barbaro pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 30 years jail. Graham Potter was released on bail which immediately convinced the Mafia he'd cooperated with the police, broken their notorious code of silence and should die. I think that they're always concerned that when the, the only person left outstanding from a large group of uh, offenders is, is that one person, that can sometimes um, spark rumours, um, concerns as, as to what his involvement is. Um, has he provided assistance? Has he not provided assistance to the police? If Potter did have police protection, he wasn't to have it for long. About a year later, he was arrested again. He was charged with two counts of conspiracy to murder. He was also charged in the AFP matters with, with a drug trafficking matter, not for the four and a half tonnes, but for a, uh, a smaller amount, but still a, a commercial amount of drugs, I believe. Potter is alleged to have been hired as a hitman to kill a guest at the wedding of the son of Melbourne identity, Mick Gatto. He was to appear uh, at court on the 1st of February 2010 um, in the Melbourne Ministers Court to answer those charges of conspiracy to murder for a committal hearing, um, at which time Graham, uh, he failed to, failed to appear. There have been various sightings of Potter reported and once he was very nearly caught near the town of Tully in the heart of the North Queensland sugarcane country. So Graham was actually intercepted by the Queensland police in a car with some other gentlemen, at which time he, he fled from the car. Because of his gruesome murder of Kim Barry, Graham Potter is considered highly dangerous. Numerous other sightings of Potter have been reported, but none has been confirmed.